in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain as our Father, the Father of all globally, the Covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kubuhi will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world, brass satellites, and on all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain. When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically, politically, with climate change and security breaches here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, weep not. All your tears are dried, because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed. And it's confirmed that there's still one hope, one way, one solution, and one power that never fails. The power of Jesus Christ reverberates this November with GCK live from Adamawa State, Nigeria. The land of beauty set to beautify your life through Christ. As the covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui will touch down in Adamawa, Nigeria with the power that never fails. Healing, deliverance, salvation. November 24 to 29, 2022. 1600 hours GMT daily and 0700 hours GMT for Sunday worship service. Young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the Impact Academy on November 26, 2022 at 0600 hours GMT. Ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on November 25, 26, 28, and 29 at 0600 hours GMT. Our guest gospel minister is Bob Feets. This is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails for all life. Power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, the gospel to every creature. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you because thus far you have led us. And we come before you now to consider this important subject. We thank you because you have challenged us already that you should sanctify your people, Lord. And Lord, it's a united prayer that as many as have not been sanctified, you will sanctify them this very day in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that our hearts will receive your word. And that as we receive the blessing of that word, will come upon every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray you make every one of us ready, so that we will receive at your hand. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Isaiah chapter 29, we have these important words in verses 11 and 12. Isaiah 29, verses 11 and 12. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. 
which men deliver to him or to one that is learned, saying, With this I pay thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, With this I pay thee. And he said, I am not learned. In those two verses, we have a problem highlighted. And it is a problem that we have in many congregations today. And among many people that try and endeavor to worship the Lord and find out the mind and the will of the Lord. It says the vision of the Lord, the mind of the Lord, the revelation that is coming from God to the heart of man, what heaven considers to be very essential, very important. And it sends to the community, the community, that book, that vision, to a person that is learned. But then it says, I cannot read it because the book in which that vision, that revelation is contained, is sealed up. And although I can read it, somebody opens the book for me, the book is sealed. And because it is sealed, I cannot understand. On the other hand, then you go to another individual that is not learned. If the learned people are failed, if the educated people are failed, if those who have studied cannot interpret the book and all, then we give to the one that is not learned. And we say, read this. Or oh, he says, I have an handicap. My problem is that I am not learned. I cannot read. Then the agony in the hearts of the people that are waiting for the revelation of God is we give it to those who can read. Is they say it is sealed. We give to those who are not learned. And then those people say they cannot read. How are we going to have the mind of God? And this is a problem you find in many circles today. You find among educated people, they try to read the word of God, and they try to find out the implications and the interpretation of the word of God for them. Unfortunately, because they depend upon their intellect, and they do not have the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. Although they are learned, the book is sealed for them. Then, on the other hand, you go to the illiterates, the people that cannot read. And although they may try to worship, and in their worship they may try to say they have the Holy Spirit. But then Jesus Christ said, when the Holy Spirit is come, it will bring to your remembrance the things that you have read. Although these illiterate people claim the Holy Spirit, they cannot read. And because they cannot read, they are also handicapped. And so the Holy Ghost is not able to bring to their remembrance what they have not read because nothing has been deposited there nothing comes out also eventually and this is a problem you want to avoid you do not want to see it on the ivory tower of learning and say we know it all we can read without the holy ghost the book is sealed unto you on the other hand you do not want to put a premium on illiteracy you do not want to give any credit to illiteracy because if there is a literacy, you cannot read that book, then the Holy Ghost will not be able to bring to your remembrance what you have not read. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 and verse 26. And at that, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. And has revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Here we find at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, before Jesus Christ came, there were people that had grown up as doctors of the law. And some of the people were referred to as the scribes. Some of these doctors of the law and scribes were Pharisees, others were Sadducees, and others were the zealots. And these people, when Jesus Christ came, they tried to check Jesus out. You remember when Jesus Christ was born, Herod demanded of these people where Christ should be born. And he went to the Old Testament and he told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. And when Jesus began to grow up at the age of 12, he was in the synagogue in their temple. And he checked them out. He was asking them questions that no boy of the age of 12 had ever asked them. And he answered questions from them that no boy of the age of 12 had ever answered. If those people had known the time of the peace of Jerusalem, 
they would have known that this is he, the anointed of the Father, the Christ, and the Messiah, the one that was to come. But he didn't realize. And then at the age of 30, he appeared in Jordan. And John recognized him and said, you should have baptized me. And how can I baptize you in water? Let it be so and leave it like that. Suffer it to be so now. Because it is that that will make us fulfill all righteousness. He went into the water. As he was coming out, the Spirit of God came upon him. And the voice of the Father from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It was not done in a corner. There were people that flooded to that place because the Bible says they came from Jordan, they came from Judea, and they came from all of Jerusalem. And all those people, they heard, they saw. When the Spirit of God came upon him, the voice of the Father said, This is he. You want salvation? This is he. You want righteousness? This is he. You want to know the mind of the Father? This is he. You want to be linked, reconciled with the Father? This is he. And well pleased in him. But unfortunately, although they saw him, they rejected him. And because they rejected him, they could not get the word that he brought to them from the Father. And at this particular time now, after Jesus Christ had emphasized all the things that needed to be emphasized, in fact, Matthew writes for us, he writes from the very beginning, and you can see that step by step, he was telling the children of Israel, behold, this is your king. And this is the one you've been expecting for hundreds and thousands of years. They didn't receive. And so at this time Jesus said, God, I thank you. Oh, my father, I thank you. Why? Because you have hidden all these beautiful things, the riches of the kingdom of God. You're feeding them away from the wise and the prudent. That is, those who are wise in their own sight. Those who are knowledgeable in their own sight. Those who feel, I knew that already. There's no other new thing. There is nothing new under heaven that I've not known. I've read that before. I've heard that before. I could talk about that myself. All those wise and prudent people, Jesus said, Oh, Father, you have hidden all these things away from them because they're self-sufficient and because they're self-confident. Then Jesus said, But, Father, you have revealed them unto babes. Babes, was he talking of toddlers, infants, the people that knew nothing. No, he was talking of Peter, James, John, Matthew, Philip, Bartholomew, and all these other adults. Even some of them married. And he called them babes. You know, it's not he wasn't calling them babes because of the physical side of it. Because in the spiritual, they were willing to learn. They knew they didn't know and they wanted to know. They knew that this was the very Christ. And they knew that if they were going to get the riches of heaven, it was from this person they were going to get it. And therefore they had an open heart. And with that open heart, they were like babes in the Lord. And Jesus said, I thank you because you have revealed them unto babes. And then he says, even so, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Until this very, all the thousand years have passed now, but till this very day, that's still the way the Lord is operating. That is still the way that he operates. He reveals unto babes. He reveals unto the people that know that they don't know. The people that know their shortcoming, the people that know their ignorance, the people that know their depravity, the people that know their carnality, the people that know that they are not there yet, but they want to be there. And they are all the time telling the Lord, I know my limitation. I know the limitation of my experience. I don't have it yet, but I want to have it. And the people that are eager, pressing on, wanting to have, wanting to see, wanting to learn, those are the people that the Father is revealing these to. I pray that the Lord will give you a heart that is tender, a heart that wants to receive, a heart that wants to learn. Now, and this is the reason God has blessed us in a church like this. Uh, because, you see, although I was born in a religious home, and my parents went to church, although at the very uh, early age we went to church and we read the Bible and we had Bible reading and family devotion every morning, but I knew next to nothing about the Bible. Then I went to a particular school where uh, they taught us there there was no God at all, and where they taught, uh, taught us that the Bible had no meaning at all, that you are the master of your faith and the captain of your own soul, that you do not need another savior. And in that confusion, I was for many years. And then I began to question in my heart. I said, oh, Lord, I'm ignorant. Watch this, uh, you know, highly educated fellow is saying, all the authorities is quoting from this and that. And all the things we dig out from encyclopedia. Are all these things right? Oh, Lord, I want to know. Because I had a tender heart, I was like a babe. Then the Lord began to draw me to the Bible. 
and I began to draw into the Bible, just wanting to study the word of God. And although I went to university and although I, I you know, did the studies that I ought to do, I was so eager to know this Bible that 1964 when I entered, I just began to read my Bible. Although the library books were there and all the things that we needed to do, all those things were there. And at that time, you know, the course I took happened to be a difficult course. We only had 12 that could make it, I think, we started with in the year one, about uh, 30, 35. By that time, there were some people had gone to the other easier branches of study. And we just had 12. And it was a very difficult course and very difficult class. And some of the lecturers, too, they were difficult. Maybe they purposely did that. But even though I had all that to do, I was telling the Lord, how could I live without knowing the Bible? How could I die without knowing the Bible? I felt that the greatest thing you could learn, you could study, was just the Bible. And the people that drew, that drew me to the Lord, that made me to know the way of salvation, well, they didn't even go to secondary school. They were illiterate. I had a lot of questions to ask that they couldn't answer. Because of all the things before I became born again, all the things that known from encyclopedia, from all those authorities in history, ancient history, and first world war, second world war, and all the people that determined they were going to succeed, they were going to do this or that, they have put that all in my brain and the planning and the goal setting and that you make up your mind in life self-reliance. That if you are going to do anything at all, don't rely on God, don't rely on anybody, rely on yourself and you will make it. Now, all the questions I had to ask, if I ask those questions from those pastors, they themselves will be confused. I could tell them things, I could ask them questions that they will not be able to make head or tail of. And I needed answers myself. What will I do? I went to God. I said, God, I want to love you. But I cannot love you in darkness. I cannot love you with all my ignorance, with all the questions I had within me. Therefore, Lord, I want to know. Teach me. I became like a baby. And I started telling, you know, just reading through the Bible and just reading through and marking this and marking that. And I'll come across a passage that I did not understand. And when I did not understand, I left it there. And then while we're in class, I don't know, I even made my papers, but I made my papers and, you know, I wasn't a mediocre student either. And yet while we're in the class or anywhere, if I was going like this, I'd be thinking of that verse. What could that verse mean? Oh Lord, what's the significance of that? All these things they are talking about, holiness and communication, how can you be sanctified? And sometimes when class, the answer will come. I mean, answer to the Bible. And I'll take my pen and jot that thing down. I read Pilgrim's Progress, I don't know how many times. And I was, uh, you know, also practicing music and doing everything. And even about a day to the exam, I'll still read my Bible as if I was going to take an exam in the Bible. My classmates will say, eh, what are you doing? You are going to fail. I said, well, if I fail, then that will be surprising because, you know, God is on my side. All you have is library book and all you have is your brain, but I have the library books you have and the brain that you have, I also have God on my side. Well, be, you'll be surprised that, you know, when I came in in year one, uh, because I didn't go to what we call HSC then, and I didn't do all the subjects I should have done because I was a kind of a self-made student myself. After secondary school, I just started preparing for GCA level. And all I could do was mathematics, the physics I couldn't do. And when I went to university, they, they accepted me for mass, mass, and geology. But it was at the point of registration that the fellow looked at my papers and I said, no, you won't do geology, you'll do physics. I said, is that so? He said, yes. And so he went around and changed everything. And I did, I knew next to nothing on these physics at that level. And there was a young man in that class that took interest in me. If we were to perform any experiment, he will say, this is how they do it. This is how they plot the graph. And this is how they measure this. And this is how they test this. I'll say thank you. If we did all the experiments, then he will tell me, ah, when you have done all the experiments and found that this and you have written all these things, how do you make your conclusion? What are the theory that you know that will back up all the things you have done to be able to present this on paper? And this young man will teach me this and teach me this. And sometimes when he wants to teach me, we're in the same class. I'll say, no time now. I'll stand for Bible now. Ah. And he'll say, uh, what's the matter with you? I'm trying to help you. You won't be able to make it. I said, I will make it. Just uh, when I have time, I'll send for you. And after studying Bible, I had to read the previous progress. I had the time to do. I had to study the theory of music. I had to, you know, practice the organ. I had to do this and that. And the fellow said, you will not make this thing. You know that I left him at the university because even though he was teaching me, he didn't make it. I made it. Because, you see, my heart, I just wanted to know God. You see, if you're like that, you really want to know God. I'm telling you that you will know God. But it is, you see, when we are proud, 
And when you feel that, no, I don't have anything to learn, I've known it all, I've learned it all, then you come into the position of the wise and the prudent. But then it will not be revealed unto you. But then it says you have revealed it unto those. And said, Jesus said, even so. Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Well, what we are talking about this morning is purity within a must. Purity within a must. And this is where you find many people, wise and prudent, they argue a lot. Oh, they say that cannot be. They say that is not possible. But I thank God if you have a tender heart to learn, the Lord will show you the same way. And he will show you that it is possible for you to live a righteous life. And it is possible for you to have a pure heart, a pure life. And even though temptations may be around you, even though the people of the world may try to confuse you, but by the grace of God, you will have the experience of purity of heart. In Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, we shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and he shall stand in his holy place. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Now, David was asking the Lord, who will eventually abide in the presence of God? And here came the answer from the Lord himself, he that has clean hands, clean hands, clean hands, and a pure heart. It is not either or. It is both and. It is both this and that. It is not either this or that. It is not either having clean hands or pure heart. It's done in both together. On the one hand, you need a pure heart. On the other hand, you need clean hands as well. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. But they shall see God. Many people may question and wonder whether there is a possibility of being pure in heart. But Jesus Christ said, oh yes, there will be. Because in fact, only those kinds of people will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Only they shall see the Lord. I want to tell you that when I was a young like you and I started reading the Bible like this, you see when you read the Bible so much, and you learn the word of God, it cuts you away from a lot of other things. In fact, the other Christians around me at that time. And because, you see, in those early days, although I was going to my regular church, I associated with the Christian people on the campus. And at the Bible study, you know, they will say, this is not possible, that is not possible. Then they will say, for what I've heard, this is possible. And when they couldn't handle me in the uh, little uh, Christian community there, that is the Bible study, then they took me to the chapel, and I was this professor of religion. And this professor of religion at the university there, they called him to the particular study that night because they felt that all these other students could not handle me in our Bible study class because I'm all the time they say without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. If, they, if we drag it here and drag it here and drag it there, I will end up by saying, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. They will say, well, what if a person does this and this, and after giving all the arguments and all the examples, I will end up by saying, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Then they felt it's difficult for fellow students to handle this man. Therefore, they called this uh, professor, you know, with a lot of degrees, head of department of religion and culture, and uh, he came that day and we were sharing the word of God. And of course, they make sure that they introduce uh, the people. So, that, so I got to suddenly notice that uh, I was now in, in that uh, circle. And they said, This is Professor So and So. You see, the light is not dead yet. Uh, it's still over there. They said, This is Professor So and So. And this is So and So. And they also brought other students that were studying religion. And some of them had mustache. And some of them had beard. Uh, just to be a little bit wild. And then they said, This is So and So. And this is So and So. And uh, so I kept quiet. And we started the Bible study the way we used to do. And then they started saying, you know, once you are saved, you are saved forever. You may smoke, you may drink, you may commit adultery, you may commit fornication. God loves you so much that once you are saved, you are saved forever. In fact, nobody can live a holy life. And you see, when I, in any group that I was, I couldn't bear that kind of thing. No matter what. And our own Bible study was much longer than all the others. Because, you know, in all the other groups and, and the various halls, whenever they said anything, they just said, yes, yes, they were the yes men. I was never a yes man. And so immediately they said that, and I just uh, spoke out and said, no, without holiness, no man shall fear the Lord. And uh, so Paul uh, now spoke out in that heavy, matured, old, old voice. 
and said, Lord, man, according to Zechariah's, according to church history, and he began to quote authors. I said, it's not author, it's what Jesus Christ said. Be you therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. It's either those authorities know more than Jesus, then they become our Savior. Or Jesus knows more than them, and then Jesus tells his Savior that I will stay with Jesus. If perfection were not possible, if holiness were not possible, if purity of heart were not possible, Jesus Christ was the economist of words. He will never say those words because he never used any redundant word. He never said anything that shouldn't have been said. And then that day, if the professor quoted his own and quoted his authority, but I went back to my authority, the word of God. Established from everlasting to everlasting. And they professors and colleges and universities and deans and all those people in the church, our God remains ever the same. And so I came out of the university. It was like I was a lone ranger. And it was like nobody would ever listen to me. And it was like, you know, this was an impossible task that I had. And so when I came to the University of Lagos in uh, 1972, uh, the Christian Union there had heard about me. They didn't know I was a troubleshooter, a troublemaker, uh, but they thought, uh, you know, I was just a quiet, nice man that would come and give them a you know, kind of message at a Christian Union. And uh, so they called me and they gave me a subject they shouldn't have given me. They gave me the subject I'll be talking about tomorrow, which is the Christian and the world. And when I got that uh, paper, they wrote to me from Unilag, and they said, this is what I'll be talking about. I knew that we were in for another deal. And so I went into the Word of God, and I came over there. And when I came, that was May 1972. And I delivered the message. For them, it was too hard for them to know that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Because the seed of God remains in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. He that does righteousness is of God. Because Christ abides in you, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Immediately I finished my day, somebody just left the congregation and took over the microphone and said, Everybody see that we have not finished yet, we do not accept that. Open confrontation. And then he started preaching his own, and you know, the people were here and there, and you know, they pulled him up there, they said, Let the old man, let the man go, uh, because nobody accepts what he has said, and so they quietly left everything down. And then he and some other people came to me after that meeting and said, the things you have said is impossible. How can a person live without sin? And that a person should not be of the world. And I quoted the Bible to them. But no, they will not accept. And then, God so what did it? It was that same year, 1972. I went to do my postgraduate at the University of Toronto. And I've made up my mind that I will not have anything to do with that kind of group because I remember 1964 to 1967, it was always argument, always, you know, dragging this and tearing this apart. And I didn't want that anymore. Uh, but then when I came and he said, I told the president of the Christian Union then, and he said that, uh, well, we still remember the event we had in May, uh, but we hope that you will not abandon us. And I said, you know, uh, a person like me is not a person you want in your fellowship, because I'm a student of the Bible, and I'm a student of John Wesley, and a student of Charles G. Finney, and I will need those Puritans and those people that emphasize holiness because the only single thing in life that matters is you have the grace of God so fill you and so saturate you that you live like Enoch, like you live like Samuel, live like Daniel, who proposed in his heart. He will not defile himself with the meat of the king that should not be shot and a bed ego that said, No, we will not bow down to you. I don't come what me. I said, I'm like the people of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, wanting to press on that I may be found, not in my righteousness, but in that righteousness which is of the faith of Jesus Christ, to be crucified with him, nevertheless to live, because it is not I that liveth, it is Christ that liveth in me, that I'm of those people that will reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, and alive unto righteousness. I'm not the kind of person you will want to your fellowship, so that I don't disorganize everything for you, and he said, we still want you all the same. And so, uh, I was on the edge like that, but again, it was a year, a year of the trouble. And so, when I became a lecturer at the University of Lagos, 1973, I decided that, well, if there were only just a few people that wanted this work of God, I think it's good for us to just get together and study the Bible. And for all those years, I was able to get 15 people that said they wanted the Bible. And so, we decided August 3rd, 1973, we'll come together and study the Bible. 
And then as we study the Bible and holiness and evangelism, the totality of the revelation of the word of God, these people were like days. And they were willing to study the word of God. And they started coming and started coming. Challenges have come in the way. And some of the people have confronted me and they have said, days will not last. I had a particular man that came to me and he said he was prophesying. He said everybody has spoken to me that this holiness is not possible, sanctification is not possible, that is not possible. And therefore now he came with a prophecy. And he came to my house and uh, you know, me, I said, uh, come in. I didn't know what he was coming for. And then when he uh, sat down, he greeted me and then he became serious like an old testament prophet. And uh, then he said that I came to you from the Lord. I said, is that so? And then he began to say that because you have not accepted to change because of this, because of that, this thing is going to break and then nobody will tell you anymore and this and that. And when he said that, I said, well, do you know something? If everybody left and I was the only one remaining that was going to stand on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He looked up at me very bold and, you know, very, very firm. And he said, that you have said is the confirmation of the word of prophecy I brought. Everybody is going to leave and this a deeper life will not remain because you stand alone and go holiness and everybody says we disagree and we are still continuing. What I want to tell you, that person that said that is nowhere to be found today. But you know, the word of God has remained. And as a look around, I just said, uh, you know, two weeks ago I was in, Ga in Ghana. And we had, you know, workers retreat. And people came from the Gambia. They came from uh, Liberia. Where the world is, you know, terrible now. Some of the people that are even serving with Ecuador, they are attending the fellowship in Liberia. And, uh, you know, we have thousands of people there. And we have the camp ground in Ghana uh, that is about uh, five times or so of the whole of this camp of IBTC. And then, you know, they have, uh, you know, they have their horse, they have this, they have that in Ghana, there in Kumasi. The Lord started that work when I was still over here at the University of Lagos. I will go there and still emphasize this same thing. You know, the same thing they told me in Ghana, they said it's impossible. It's impossible. But I want to tell you that last December, in the December retreat alone, we registered more than 26,000 people. Adults without children. And just last week, I was in Ivory Coast. And uh, when we got to, when I got to Ivory Coast in about 1984, and we started holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You know, those uh, French people told me, they say, uh, something they work in the English speaking country, something they work in Nigeria, but that when the life of French speaking people is totally different, you cannot do that in Ivory Coast. I said, what? You don't want Jesus Christ in French speaking country? You don't want life of holiness in French speaking country? And so we started. And I want to tell you that I was there just last week. I came back on Saturday. And uh, we had people from Cape Verde. We had people from Guinea Bissau. We had people from Senegal. We had people from uh, Africa, all over, in all their provinces. And, uh, you know, the, the inspector of police there. Uh, who is uh, in their own system, almost next to the, uh, next to the uh, president, is a member of uh, the Deeper Life there. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the fellow was, uh, you know, driving me back from the place. They put me to the uh, place of meeting. Uh, you know, was uh, a policeman himself, but a member of the church. And a lot of those people there. And, and guess what we are doing? Talking about this same thing, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And as we in that French country, just last week, thousands of them, thousands of them. And they were rejoicing in the Lord. And I can tell you a lot of things that have taken place there. You know what I'm telling you? If you stay with God, God will stay with you. If you stay with the word of God, God will stay with you. And what appears very small, and the Lord is going to multiply it in Jesus' name. Now you may not know that in the late 70s when we started what we call the HIP, Higher Institution Program, what we later uh, called now DLCF, Deep Alive uh, Campus Fellowship. Uh, you may not know that when we started it was a lot of trouble. Uh, some of our students when we started this uh, Deep Alive Campus Fellowship, they were locked up on the campus. And the other people uh, who were in the other groups, they were making trouble with them. Those will not stay, that will not stay, those cannot be. Because they cannot have deeper life on the campus, it will bring division, it will bring difficulty. And you know, they wrote, wrote letters to me, petition letters, and wrote this and wrote that and everything, and said, cancel this thing, cancel this thing. I uh, would have canceled it if they were ready for holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. If they were doing it and reaching those people, they would have canceled it, but I said, no, if they cancel it, are we going to lift up the banner of holiness? If we cancel it, are we going to emphasize this sanctification purity of heart? Blessed are the pure in heart. Only they shall see the Lord. So I said, they will not cancel it. Oh yes, we suffered. 
Oh yes, since we are reaching against us. Oh yes, some people even made us enemies. It was like it was a personal fight. But look at it right now. Things have changed. And things are changing. And look at it as we are here. And we declare the whole, the totality, the entirety of the word of God. It pays to suffer for Christ. What I just want to tell you is that uh, those of us, I'm getting older, not getting younger, and uh, by the grace of God, although you see that my voice is so strong, yet, um, you know, little by little, I'm getting older than you are. I'm, I'm sure you understand, I'm a little bit older than you are. And uh, because of that, as we pass on, you are then to take my place, and then you are to carry this torch of holiness. And every campus where you go, and every community where you go, and maybe you know that will scatter you all through the continent of Africa. And everywhere you go, you will declare without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And when you do it like I've done it, to suffer like I've suffered, you emphasize it like I, like I emphasize, you read the Bible like I do, you study like I do, and you devote yourself like I do. I believe that God can even do much more through you than through me. Uh, because, you know, when, when I started, I didn't have any predecessor, I didn't have any example, I didn't have any challenge, I didn't, in fact, all the people I had, they were telling me, slow down, slow down, I didn't have anybody to challenge me, I didn't have anybody to encourage me, even the pastors in the church I was going at that time, they were saying, this is too much, slow down, even though that church believes in holiness, and yet when I brought out the real holiness material, they said, this is too much, this is too much, slow down, and I said, no, I will not slow down. And I got kicked out. It's as a result of not knowing that you are here this morning. Don't walk away. You know the fact of your redemption. You agree with that fact of redemption. You internalize that fact of redemption. You trust your soul, your eternity, your interest, everything into you. And then it gives you the hope for life eternal. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. When that salvation comes, a change will follow. In Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you come into Christ, when you become a child of God, things change. Things change. Your life will change. The direction of your life will change. Your conduct will change. The activities of your life will change. Your hobby will change. Your interests will change. Your extracurricular activities, the things that used to turn you on, used to interest you, everything will change. And of course, your association will change. And all the things that you have been doing, your relationships with people to you, everything will change. That is what it means when it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature in a real sense, in a true way. All things are passed away, all things are become new. And in First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. I work to righteousness and sin not. I work to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. For the apostle was speaking to the Corinthian believers. And in the Corinthian church, there were some people that didn't know that when the grace of God comes in, that the grace of God makes us to live an overcoming life, a victorious life. And so he challenged them and he called them to the life of righteousness. He said, I work to righteousness. Don't sleep. I work to righteousness. It's not time to slumber. I work to righteousness. It's not time to forget yourself. I work to righteousness. And sin not. And sin not. A lot of sins had crept into the Corinthian church. Fornication had crept in. Even eating things, sacrificed to idols, had crept in. Paul's doctrine concerning the resurrection had crept in. A lot of things that were not right for Christians. Carnality had also crept in. And yet Paul the Apostle now said, Come back, awake to righteousness and sin not. Then he said, If the son of you have not the knowledge of God. The people that do not have the knowledge of God, they are the people that still say, say they are born again and they are living in sin. They are born again, girlfriend is there. They are born again, boyfriend is there. They are born again, dancing is there. They are born again, drinking is there. They are born again, but they are still lying. They are born again, they are still playing coupon and lottery. And they are born again, but a lot of things they still do. Awake to righteousness and sin now. For some have not the knowledge of God. And he told the Corinthian church, I speak this to your shame. Then in First Timothy chapter five, First Timothy chapter five, verse two, the elder women as mothers and sisters, and the younger as sisters with all purity. 
you know, it is important for us to notice that as young people and even older people, we should so serve the Lord with purity of life. And your life should not be a mess. You shouldn't, uh, you know, have all these uh, various evil things that the young people are doing today. Uh, messing up their lives with immorality. If we say we are born again, let there be a clear court experience of being born again. You know, there are challenges that we have as students. I remember when I was a student and uh, my roommate, I got into reading the Bible with me uh, every morning. And uh, there were times, although we couldn't continue because... Um, if I not on sin, if I not on, uh, you know, some of the things that he used to do, the following morning, if I said, let us read the Bible, he said, no, I have not recovered from the one of yesterday. Uh, so we might uh, miss it for about a few, about a few uh, days, and then I, you know, played with him and touched him a little bit. So we we'll start all over again. And then I will tell him that uh, you uh, do the uh, devotion this morning, just two of us, and then we will open the Bible. And uh, so we will read the passage, and with his uh, baptism by God, he will say a few things, and then he will say, I'm exhausted, do you have anything to say? And I'm never exhausted, you know that. And um, so if he said, I'm exhausted, do you have anything to say? Then I took it from there on and started talking on salvation again. But we will always had a particular problem, it will be Saturday afternoon. And I knew that his girlfriend will come. That Saturday afternoon, and uh, what the other roommates do is that uh, politely and quietly, when that uh, lady comes in, uh, we'll say, How are you? and so and so. And then, uh, you know, do as I, I wanted to go to the library before, to the cafeteria before, I wanted to go to the uh, supermarket and buy this or that, just to give them a chance to do whatever they want to do and pack all their books and everything. But you know, I changed my timetable. Because I knew that that was the time that that lady will come. Uh, the things I should have done in the library and other places I would have done it. And at the time she ought to be there, I'll be at my table in that room studying my book. And uh, when she comes in, I will say, uh, welcome, so and so. Uh, and then after she, if uh, she didn't uh, meet him there, saying so maybe she went to, he went to the toilet or something, and uh, we'll say, how is uh, so and so? I don't want to name him because now he's a lecturer in you know, one of the universities. And uh, I will say, well, he's uh, is, uh, coming. And I say, before he comes, I would have found a material. Literature, Christian literature. And I will say, why don't you read this before he comes? And that thing is a knocking thing. I say, you will you will enjoy this one. And then she will, you know, because of the way I said it, and because also I was his senior to even, uh, you know, his boyfriend, he will not be able to reject it, so he will be opening it over and over, and then I will sit out there uh, doing my work. And then when they wait and they discuss, uh, you know, for one hour, one and a half hours, and they say some things aloud that, aloud, that will have made me to, you know, pack my books and, uh, you know, go to the library or go somewhere, I just sit down there, I change subjects, I change position, I sit out there. And after about, uh, you know, about three hours and three and a half hours, that lady will be so sad because of this person that will never cooperate. I never cooperate with sin. I never cooperate with sin. Why should you cooperate with sin? Why should you give them chance and liberty to do evil? I see that tight there. In fact, if, it's, it's, if it is time for food in the evening, if she was still staying there, I will not go for food, I will sit there. I've always been a troublemaker, you know. And then as I sat down there, eventually at about 6.30, 7 o'clock, uh, she will say, uh, I want to be going now. And then I will greet her, she will barely answer me. Uh, because she, was, she wasn't happy. And you can tell the following morning, if I called my roommate for, you know, the, the morning devotion, no, not, no morning devotion. Uh, but you know, for those three years I was there, we were roommates together, we were there in that same room together, and except it was only day that I was not there, you couldn't practice evil in that room. You couldn't do it. If you came in with, you know, other people were coming and be joking with him, if they said anything against the Bible, even if I was preparing for exam, uh, you cannot dishonor my Lord, and I'll continue with exam. You cannot do it. I'll rise up and say, in this room, in B3, Ezekiel Hall, you don't do this in this place, in verse of Ibadan. And immediately I took my stand like that, you know, they had to backpedal and they had to say, oh, we're sorry, pastor. I didn't ever know I would become a pastor. They started calling me pastor before I became a pastor. 
but you know it is good to take your stand for the lord you will not sing when you become a child of god and you will not permit other people you will not give them license to sing you know some students will even give, give the key of their room and say go and use my room never how can you do that if you're a child of god other people will have iron clothes the clothes that those people are going to wear how can you do that other people will give transportation and money to go to their dancing party to go to this and that never never when i was a student i knew that you have to glorify god the way you are living and in verse 22 of first timothy chapter 5 first timothy chapter 5 verse 22 it says lay hands suddenly on no man neither be partaker of other men's sins keep thyself pure you see as a child of god one you want to live a righteous life yourself because if anyone is in christ jesus is a new creature all things are passed away and behold all things are become new not only that you do not condemn the sins of others encourage the sins of others you do not connive with them to so continue to do evil you will not be a partaker of other men's sins keep thyself pure and it was you know it's been like that with me by the grace of god since those school days and I have uh, I've been everywhere and uh, by the grace of God I'm invited to speak here, invited to speak over there. Some of them I'm not able to honor because I'm busy, but others I'm able to honor. And those ones I honor, uh, for example, I have a letter waiting now and expecting me uh, in uh, Britain uh, next year at a particular time. And the, the fellow wrote there, he said, we well, want you to come and talk on church growth and then they put it as church growth and holiness. And then he wrote as a footnote, he said, I have heard that uh, you talk, you like to talk much on holiness, and we do not want to disrupt the way you like to minister. So please come and talk to us on church growth and holiness. Let them know you something good. Let them know you that you stand on the word of God, that others may play with the word of God, that this is where you stand. So then point number one, salvation and righteous living. Number two, sanctification and inward purity. What do we call sanctification? If somebody had already been saved, what does he need again that you call a different experience, a subsequent experience, an experience that will do a greater, deeper work that has have been done already? This is called sanctification. Sanctification. And what is it? Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 29 for an illustration. Second Chronicles chapter 29 for an illustration in verse 5 and said unto them hear me ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the lord god of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place now as a casual reader of the bible you may not understand the significance of the verse i've read to you now let's refresh our memory with the worship style and the worship location of the children of Israel, they had um, a tabernacle. And that tabernacle of worship was divided into three parts. You had the outer court, you had the holy place, and you had the holy of holies. It was at the outer court, they had the brazen altar. At the brazen altar, they were offered the first sacrifice to atone for their sins, which is to us a symbol, a picture of salvation and then at the holy place that was the place they will offer the showbread and that to us signifies the second experience but then there was another place of holy of holy and the most inward place and that signifies to us the baptism in the holy ghost and then it says over here sanctify now yourselves then he said sanctify the house of the lord god of your fathers and when he said sanctify that house then he amplifies, he explains it at the latter part of that verse. He said, carry forth the fieldiness out of the holy place. Now do you know that in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we are now the temple of God. And our heart is now that holy place. And we need to carry forth the fieldiness, the fieldiness of the spirit. The one that has been in the heart. It's that sanctification that the power of God himself and the cleansing of the blood of Jesus will carry forth, will take away, will cleanse up, will purge the filthiness out of your innermost being. In Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. And in therefore, 
these premises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god if it were not possible why will the inspired writer put it in the bible if it were not possible why will he say let us do it as if with urgency with earnestness with faith and with clarity this is what we have to do this is our duty it says let us cleanse ourselves then it says from filthiness and then it says from all filthiness when i read the bible i do not overlook any any word you know why because jesus said not a judge or teacher will pass without being fulfilled when it says a judge or teacher he was using in greek language something like the dot of an eye the crossing of the teeth so in the vernacular it, it will mean that all the word of god are so important that not the dot of an eye or the crossing of a tea will pass without being fulfilled i said that to say this, to say this that it says let us cleanse ourselves from all 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 filthiness if it were not possible why will you say and i will say as long as there remains a little jot of filthiness a little blot of filthiness a little stain of filthiness of the flesh or of the spirit then you have not heard you have not heard you look at your own heart you look at your own thought you look at your own motive you look at your imagination or look at what you call big dreaming and look at the things that pass within your heart and the things that you build over the things that the things that you think over if there is any form of filthiness there it may not come out in a bad language it may not come out in a vulgar language it out in any action of immorality it may not come out in anything that anybody can say you have committed sin if it is deep down there in your soul in your mind in your brain in your intention you have not done it it's there in the intention if it's there in the imagination in the motive in the very heart then all filthiness has not gone and you do not want to stop short until everything is fulfilled when it says let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit and of the spirit in my earlier days before we started a deeper life 1771 i used to move around a lot of the scripture union and this time we are having a uh, scripture union meeting in enugu and uh, i was uh, handling the bible study a uh, series of first epistle of john and we had prepared the bible study from chapter 1 to chapter 5 and i was to be doing the review and we, we started uh, that review uh, the first night because we we'll generally do that review when all the others and the younger ones from point one to point three uh, at that time when they had gone to bed and then those of us or those are students from point four and five that were to actually do the teaching with those that were non-students then we we're doing the review at night and then uh, as we we're taking the review and we came to chapter three that who serve as born of god does not commit sin because the seed of god remains a bad sin it cannot sin god favored us with the uh, outpouring of the spirit of soberness sobriety and seriousness and that night we went into that word and went into that word we forgot that we were preparing to review just to teach the following day and you know that there was uh, one of the sisters there she heard that word it broke her down oh yes she had been saved and I'm talking about real salvation in the scripture union you know, in those days when we were involved, all this jury and planning and music, all those things were not there. I mean, we really went into the word of God. And that night, that woman, you know, just stood there and prayed and prayed and prayed and forgot that if she didn't have enough sleep, she would not be awake enough the following day to lead the Bible study. And she prayed and prayed and prayed until, you know, the Lord revealed to her how the Lord whitened her heart, purified everything. She loved God so much, even beyond the things we were discussing in that Bible study, the Lord sanctified her. And after the Lord sanctified her, by the time we got up the following morning and she was giving testimony to us, you know, she had been giving testimony to us, we run down her eyes and said, Holiness. Holiness. She couldn't say any other thing. And when I don't know whether we even allowed her to teach because emotionally and because of all the things that had happened to her, she couldn't compose herself to, you know, begin because if she started reading a particular verse when she came across the grace of God that appears unto all men, teaching us that we deny ungodliness and worldly love. When he came across anything like that, she might break down just weeping and say, Holiness, holiness. She wanted to drink all the holiness she could have from heaven. The Lord did something for her soul. It was in that 
meeting of another woman after we are taught on some education like that. And uh, we, we also gathered the people together after the junior ones had gone to sleep. We had in the night what we call digging deep. And in that digging deep is where we go into, into the real meal. Because it says the meal belongs to the people that are skilled in the world. But the people we mean that we are wanting to press on to higher ground, we call them together. We are digging deep. And uh, when we finish that digging deep, I think about 1 a.m. in the night. And then when we finished, and then we were handed up for prayer, and we went back to go and sleep. There was this woman again, very serious with the Lord. The Lord sanctified her, not only that. We didn't, you know, in the scripture, you know, at that time, we were not allowed to, you know, talk about everything, about being baptized in the early days, about speaking in tongues and all that. But she stayed there, and you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, 5 a.m., the power came from her. And she started speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues, spiritual union. And then when we all came in the, at the morning time for just a morning prayer before the real program began, uh, the, the, the brightness and the glory and the face of this woman, we knew that she had touched heaven. And I pray that every one of you, every one of you will touch heaven. And you know, at the time she was giving a testimony, you could tell, you could tell, you could tell the fire of God within her soul. You could tell the whiteness of her spirit. You could tell the holiness and the purity. You could tell the power of God. You see, when she finished her testimony, not a dry eye remained in that congregation. You know, we were not used in the scripture, you know, to weeping and crying, but oh, we cried, we cried. We cried, we cried because of the glory of God that came down. We cried because of the purity from the throne of God that came down and you know it was a blessed wonderful moment that we never forgot in fact i saw some of those people with the scripture union uh, about 10 years later and you know they will tell me they will, they will call my name and say do you remember anything do you remember Wilcox Memorial in Abba? Do you remember that uh, state signature union at, uh, and, uh, at uh, the other place, uh, I think, uh, Kigo? And do you remember that other one? Do you remember that other one in Port Harcourt in Oran? We just went everywhere and everywhere we went the power of God. And the holiness of God was just playing. I want those days back. When God himself will show, will open heaven to us, and you, everyone, he will give you this holiness beyond your dream. Beyond your desire. If you will just say, Lord, give it to me, he will give it to you. And you know, the, the Lord just brought in my understanding. As I just said, oh Lord, I know nothing, and all that I want in life is just to serve you in holiness and righteousness. All the days of my life, if you did it for me, he will do it for you. You know, I still remember. As a student then, I've gotten saved in 1964, April 5. And then I went to the University of Ibaru. And, uh, you know, in these, uh, in those sessions that I used to, you know, just lock up myself and just read my Bible, seeking the face of God, I'd gotten saved uh, before I entered the university. But then, as I was there, just reading the Bible, reading the Bible, it was on the 17th of November, 1965, and about 6.30 in the evening, that I just closed the door and locked the door, I said, Lord, today is today. It wasn't a meeting like this. It wasn't a congress like this. It wasn't a church service. I just locked the door. I read the word of God that said, if there is only one person in the whole world that will want to get sanctified and remain holy, even all even the people are not holy and not holy and not righteous, and they don't want it. If God can find one person on the face of the earth that will see God and be holy, I said, God, I am that one. God, I am that one. Whoever wants it, whoever does not want it, God, I am that one. And I just locked the door. The the, the others were the cafeteria, they were eating. But I said, oh God, I don't want food. If you don't sanctify me and make me holy, where will I be? And what will education do me? And I just, I was by my side, the side of my bed, kneeling down and praying. Tears coming out. Nobody prayed to me. I was just reading that thing. And you know, before a long time, that time, that very evening, 17th of November, I will never, never, how can you forget? When you meet God face to face, how can you forget? When he brings the fire from the altar of heaven, how can you forget? When he circumcises your heart, when he purges your heart, when he takes that Adamic nature away from you, how can you forget? When the fire continues to burn, and you know, when I came out of that room that very day when I was sanctified, I don't know whether I could talk to anybody. In fact, I still remember the name of a particular brother now, a beloved brother, but not in deeper life. Because, you know, 1965, there was no deeper life. 66, no deeper life. He belonged to a particular place. He saw me like this. He said, my brother, the way I look at your face, you are going too far. I couldn't tell him what was happening. But he knew because he had been a Christian before I became a Christian. And he said, the way I look at you, you are going too far. Because, you know, I was at been at the altar with God. And I said, I lay this thing upon the altar. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Many years, think about it. 1965 to this time, many years have come and gone. 
But I thank God that consecration I made in that room B3 as it were hall, it is still standing today. And I'm still keeping on it today. And that is why I still invite a lot of people that you young people make a covenant with the Lord. That the Lord will sanctify you, that the Lord will purify you. And when he does, there will be such a work in your life that you will continue. And if Jesus tarries a you know many years, they will still find you in the kingdom of God. Can you do it? I said, can you do it? Oh yes, you can do it. Point number three, supplication and holiness experience. If God is going to do it, you will need to pay. If God is going to do it, you will need to call upon the name of the Lord. If God is going to do the prayer, your prayer is not just a regular prayer. It's not the ordinary prayer. It's not the prayer that somebody is pushing you. It's not the prayer that you are opening your eyes and looking at the time. It's not the kind of prayer you are praying. You say, well, when are we going to stop? It's a kind of prayer you are totally abandoned unto the Lord. In Osea chapter 10 verse 12. Osea chapter 10 verse 12. Say to yourselves in righteousness. Say to yourselves in righteousness, weep in mercy, and break up your fallow ground. You see that? Break up your fallow ground. If you see that all these things do not move you, so you say, then my heart needs to be broken. If you see that all these things do not plant a strong desire within you to move on with the Lord, then you say, my heart will need to be broken. Say to yourselves in righteousness, and weep in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. And then it says, for it is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. How long are you supposed to seek the Lord? Until he comes and lays righteousness upon us. Not a trickle, not a drop, not just a little part of righteousness, a flood of righteousness. Until he comes and lays righteousness upon you. When you are sanctified like that, after you are prayed, you pray in faith. You consecrate yourself to the Lord. You hold on to the hands of the altar. You say like Jacob, I will not let you go except you bless me. You come like I say, a woe is sent to me. And I'm undone because I, I'm of unclean news and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean news. For my eyes have seen the king, the king of glory. Then flew an angel unto me. And there was a coal of fire from the altar of God. He touched his knees. And then your sin, he said, your sin is spoiled. Your sin is taken away. Your iniquity is taken away. You pay until a real work of sanctification has been done. Now what is the evidence of sanctification? That is number four. Well, there are, there are a lot of things we can talk about as the evidence of sanctification. But one, there will be purity in your heart. Your motives become pure. Your imagination becomes pure. Your thoughts become pure. Your life within and without becomes pure. You become so sensitive to anything that is out of the way that you will not want it in your life. Holiness surrounds you. Holiness saturates you. Holiness envelops you. Holiness runs in the brains of your blood system. Holiness is in your mind, is in your brain, is in your thought. Holiness is what you are looking for, what you are designing. Holiness is what so saturates you. It's like you are injected with the injection of heaven. And that holiness line is always within. And anything that deviates from holiness, oh, you will hate it. You will not want it. It may be appearing to be little, any shade of sin, any shadow of iniquity. You don't want it in your life because there is that purity of heart. Not only that, there is love. You love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And you will do anything. You will go anywhere. You will confront anyone if God wants you to do it. Because it is a kind of love that loves God supremely. And you love your neighbors as yourself. There will be meekness in you. When you are really sanctified. You know about Jesus Christ. They are him, But you will not answer. They tell lies against him. But you will not answer. The meekness of the Lord. The gentleness of the Lord will be upon you. And also you will be teachable. Because you know, the stony heart has been taken away. A heart of flesh has been given unto you. And so, all that will be within you. And then, there will be humility. You know, you will be so humble that people can step on you. And people can take your life from you. And you will never rebel. You will never petition anything, anyone for anything. Because of that mark of heart circumcision. Heart purity in your life. There will be unity with the brethren. You see, when you become really sanctified, the people of God who believe the whole Bible, you will be united with them. You will not have a disagreeing spirit. There will be no pride in you. The pride that will look down on other people, the pride that will belittle other people, you have real unity with the people of God. And of course, holiness. Holiness will be your lifestyle. Holiness will be what you do in the day and what you do in the night. And even in the night when other people are not there, holiness will be your watchword. Now, the base is what you want. The Lord himself 
and failed us to set yourself in righteousness and break up your final ground. You know, if there, if there ever came a time in my life when I did not want more holiness, more love, more unity, and more of heaven's fire to be brought on my soul, I have to break my father heart all over again. It will mean that my heart is becoming insensitive to the call of heaven. And if there ever comes in your any time in your life, when you can hear about holiness and righteousness and have purity and the circumcision of life, and then there is nothing in you that wants to cry out and say, Oh God, make me another Enoch today. I want that holiness. I want that purity. I want it to be upon the altar of my heart. I think it will be time to break up your fellow ground. In fact, the Lord says, It is now time. It is now time. It is now time to seek the Lord. And how long are we going to seek the Lord? Are you hungry? Or are you not, are you not willing to pray? It is time to seek the Lord until He comes and rains righteousness upon you. 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 Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord until He comes and raise righteousness upon you. In the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain, as our Father, the Father of all globally, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kubuyi will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world, via satellites and on all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain. When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically, politically, with climate change and security breaches here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, weep not. All your tears are dried, because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. And it's confirmed that there's still one hope, one way, one solution, and one power that never fails. The power of Jesus Christ reverberates this November with GCK live from Adamawa State, Nigeria. The land of beauty set to beautify your life through Christ. As the covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumuyi will touch down in Adamawa, Nigeria with a power that never fails. Healing, deliverance, salvation. November 24 to 29, 2022. 1600 hours GMT daily and 0700 hours GMT for Sunday worship service. Young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the Impact Academy on November 26, 2022 at 0600 hours GMT. Ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on November 25, 26, 28 and 29 at 0600 hours GMT. Our guest gospel minister is Bob Feets. This is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails for all life. Power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, 
the gospel to every creature.